so much. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here today to share with you some of our research findings on how Americans and also some international audiences are thinking about U.S. foreign policy these days. Uh, we've got some slides, so let me get those up. All right. So, Today, we're going to talk about uh, a number of our different survey projects, uh, and the data comes from primarily four sources. Uh, the 2020 Chicago Council Survey. This is the latest incarnation of our long running series on American public attitudes on US foreign policy. Uh, the Chicago Council Survey project began in 1974 at a time of great uncertainty in US foreign policy. Uh, it has continued since then and is now done annually. You'll also hear from some of our 2020, 2020 run uh, U.S.-Russia Binational Survey Project, so this does include data from Russia, uh, done in concert with Levada Center, uh, the last independent pollster remaining in Russia. You also get data from our 2021 U.S.-Iran Binational Survey conducted with Iran Poll, a Toronto-based pollster that does survey research inside Iran, and also a few items from a 2021 Trilateral Asia Survey. Uh, this was a project conducted in the U.S., Japan, and South Korea simultaneously. Today we'll be showing you some of the U.S. results. So to begin, when we conducted the 2020 Chicago Council survey uh, last summer, we were looking at primarily four uh, main questions. Uh, and this last one has come up since the election, obviously. Uh, first, how concerned are Americans about the coronavirus relative to other threats? Second, what foreign policy approaches do Americans prefer given the experience they've just had of the pandemic? Has this experience impacted American support for international engagement? because at the time there was a very reasonable assumption that the, uh, the pandemic would depress American internationalism, that it would make Americans turn inward uh, and sort of try to close themselves off from a world that was being ravaged by a disease. And then lastly, since November, we've had to ask ourselves what implications all of this will have for the new Biden administration. Thank you, Craig. Um, so to start, um, let's talk about this question, which is one that we've been asking since um, we've started the Chicago Council survey and which really, uh, I think, gets at some of those questions that Craig was just mentioning about how the pandemic has affected Americans' desire for engagement in the world. So the question asks, do you think it will be best for the future of the country if we take an active part in world affairs or if we stay out of world affairs? And you'll see that um, over the years, this has had some fluctuations, but it really hasn't ever dipped below 54% and it hasn't gone above 71%. What we found in 2020 is that this hasn't really changed. Um, from the previous year, uh, it went from 69% to 68% of Americans saying that they want to take an active role in world affairs. Um, so despite all of these premonitions that the pandemic would cause this kind of shift in how Americans view US engagement, uh, it really hasn't. And beyond uh, this sort of broad metric of taking an active part in world affairs, this also, uh, this also extends to security and trade uh, factors as well. So in the next slide, we can see that uh, support for US security alliances has remained pretty steady. And in many cases, well, in all of these cases, uh, increased by a certain degree. So the question here is, uh, which of the following comes closest to your view on US security alliances? Do they mostly benefit the US, mostly benefit our allies, benefit both, or benefit neither? Now, um, in all three of these cases, um, a plurality or a majority of Americans in 2020 said that it benefits both the US and our allies in these regions. Um, it's a little higher in East Asia and Europe um, in terms of the percentages that say it benefits both, 52% of Americans in East Asia and 61% of Americans for Europe, whereas it's slightly lower for the Middle East, 49%. Um, undoubtedly, this is a result of kind of costly engagements that um, have kind of come under the spotlight recently, talking about keeping troops in, in the Middle East, whether to withdraw, and uh, certainly we've had some 
big events to that effect since we've had this survey. So it will be interesting to see what the results look like in the next time we ask this question. Um, but the story is that the pandemic has not affected Americans' views on US security alliances. In fact, it seems to have increased since January 2020. Um, in the uh, next slide, we'll see that this also applies to views of international trade. So um, this question asks, overall, do you think international trade is good or bad for the US economy? consumers like you, creating jobs in the United States, and US relations with other countries. Um, now, in 2020, we found that majorities of Americans still say that um, international trade is good for each of these things. Um, I think what stood out to me when we were first examining this data is that we saw a slight drop um, in creating jobs in the United States and the US economy. Um, fewer people are saying that international trade is good for those things, um, whereas it stayed relatively consistent for um, its effect on inter, uh, U.S. relations with other countries and uh, consumers like you. My thought on this is that people saw um, kind of those immediate effects of the pandemic, um, global economic downturn, high rates of unemployment almost immediately. Um, and I think that probably contributed to these decreases among those two items. But overall, um, American support for trade really has not faltered too much. Um, I'll be curious to see what these numbers look like when um, we run the survey this year or the next time we ask this question. But overall, American support has really climbed up significantly since 2016. Um, and I'll also add that this is a bipartisan consensus. Um, Republicans and Democrats are generally on the same page in how they view international trade's effect on these various things. So um, an interesting, I think an interesting point that this is a bipartisan belief. Um, but um, talking about lessons of the pandemic, we see that the story is uh, not quite so straightforward. So um, this question gets more directly at uh, how people view the pandemic and its effect uh, on the United States. So this question, which of the following statements comes closest to your view? The coronavirus outbreak has made it clear that it's more important for the United States to coordinate and collaborate with other countries to solve global issues or to be self-sufficient as a nation so we don't need to depend on others. Um, now, here we see that there is a pretty stark divide. 80% of Democrats say that the United States should coordinate and collaborate with other countries to solve global issues, while 58% of Republicans instead say that uh, the United States should be self-sufficient as a nation, so we don't need to depend on others. Now, this isn't necessarily the first time that we've run across um, a sentiment like this, but I think this, um, it's more emphasized with this question, and I think these results are one that you should keep in mind as we're going through this presentation, as um, I believe they kind of color people's responses on a lot of the questions. Um, and we'll see that the sentiment of collaboration versus self-sufficiency comes up a lot. Um, and the next item too, I think, is also a, a relatively uh, determining factor in the way that people respond to our questions. So this, um, this gets at American exceptionalism. Um, the question is, some people say the United States has a unique character that makes it the greatest country in the world. Others say that every country is unique and the United States is no greater than other nations. Which view is closer to your own? Um, now, we see the overall number has been dropping consistently since this question was first asked in 2012. However, uh, Republican views on this question have stayed largely uh, relatively constant. Uh, it was 85% in 2012 and now it's 80% in 2020 um, with some variation. So. That really hasn't changed among Republicans, but for Democrats, it's gone from two thirds saying that the United States is the greatest country in the world to now just 35%. Uh, so it kind of flipped. Now two thirds are saying that the United States is no greater than other country. Um, among independents, they're pretty split with 52% saying it's the greatest country. And I'm sure um, close to that saying no greater than other country. So this is another question that I view as um, kind of fundamental in examining Americans' beliefs on a lot of foreign relations, um, as I believe that, you know, it's a determining factor in how they think the U.S. should uh, engage with a lot of problems. And um, I also think that it is a contributing factor to this next question, which looks at foreign policy threats that the U.S. is facing. Now, this is a, a question that we've been running for uh, almost the entirety of the Chicago Council Survey's history. And it's a really interesting look at how Americans view um, 
different threats that the United States is facing. It changes a lot, and um, this year is certainly no different. So overall, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic took the top spot, 67% of Americans saying it's a critical threat. The responses of this question being critical threat, uh, important but not critical, and not an important threat. So yes, overall, we see COVID-19 pandemic, domestic violent extremism, development of China's world power, global economic downturn, and political polarization in the United States. A mixture of domestic problems and international problems. Um, interestingly, so I mean, to put it in context, this is from July 2020, um, right as you know, last summer, things were, uh, there was a lot of unrest throughout the country with the protests um, and so on. So in that regard, I think that result is a direct reaction to those events, but um, I think that's another one that will be interesting to see what people think um, the next time we run this survey. But to go in, into these more specific groups, um, we see that Republicans and Democrats have very different views of what the top threats are. Um, for Republicans, we see the top threat being uh, development of China as a world power, followed by international terrorism, large numbers of immigrants and refugees coming to the US, domestic violent extremism, and Iran's, or Iran's nuclear program. These are what we have kind of termed traditional security threats, things that people have been kind of worried about for a while, focus on um, kind of international actors, be they sort of opponents of the United States, China and Iran, or terrorists. Um, in fact, terrorism has traditionally been one of the largest threats year to year, but it's dipped, um, I think, the last year or two, just as other things have kind of taken the spotlight. Um, but um, so in contrast to these traditional security threats, we see that Democrats have a very different set of uh, beliefs about what the threats facing the United States are. So first, coming in at 87% is the COVID-19 pandemic, followed by climate change, racial inequality in the United States, foreign interference in American elections, and economic inequality in the United States. Um, one thing that I think sticks out is that all of these are very large and sometimes abstract problems that don't have a definite solution. Um, which, um, well, I'm sure you could say the same for the Republican top threats, but um, they're more these kind of global threats that affect uh, everyone in, in some regard. Um, so thinking about also between lessons from the pandemic, you know, cooperation versus self-sufficiency, um, greatest country versus not the greatest country, and now um, these sort of threats facing the United States versus threats facing a more broad uh, range of people, I think you can start to see how we are seeing these partisan divides um, throughout the survey. Um, and we actually have a little bit more recent data on threats to US security. Um, this was asked in January uh, of 2021, actually, um, shortly after the events in early January. Um, and we can see uh, the effect of that in this question. Now. Um, You'll notice that this has violent white nationalist groups in the United States and militant far right extremist groups in the United States, um, which are very, I think, similar um, in substance. But um, what we did was we split this question so that half of our sample received one of those items and the other half received um, the other item. So um, just a brief explanation of why you're seeing that. But um, so you'll see that among Democrats, the top threat by far is violent white nationalist groups and militant far right extremist groups in the United States. Um, coming up next, interestingly for Democrats, is Russia, um, which I think I'll talk about this a little bit more later when I'm talking about our Russia data. But um, I think there has been there's emerged a slight partisan divide on issues relating to Russia um, following the Trump administration. Um, again, I'll, get, I'll get to that a little more later. As far as Republicans, um, very much by far, they view China as the greatest threat to US security. Um, and I think this is an increasing, um, this is an increasing view among Americans in general. Craig will speak more about this a little bit later. Um, but you can very clearly see that more so than any of these other ones, China is the top threat on uh, Republicans' minds. Um, after that, we see militant far left extremist groups in the United States and and then terrorist groups outside of the United States like ISIS or Al Qaeda. So um, there are a wide range of security threats that people see, but they are definitely focused in um, one or two different areas um, for a lot of Americans. 
Um, and next, um, Craig is going to speak more about uh, foreign policy approaches. Thanks, Brendan. So we've seen that Republicans and Democrats are divided on a number of issues. They're divided on what poses the greatest threats to the United States. Um, they're divided over whether the United States is an exceptional nation. Uh, they're also, to, to a certain extent, divided over how the U.S. should approach its foreign policy. Uh, for Democrats, their preferred foreign policy approaches tend to be uh, internationalist and collaborative. Uh, Democrats would generally like the U.S. to participate more in international organizations, to provide more humanitarian aid, to sign more international agreements, uh, including free trade agreements. Uh, and in, in general, they are big fans of working with U.S. allies. Republicans have a slightly different preference, uh, and their preference tends to be a bit more on the military end of things. Um, they're more likely than Democrats are to favor uh, increasing the use of drone strikes against suspected terrorists abroad, um, using more coercive economic measures like sanctions and tariffs. Um, though, you will note on here, uh, a majority of Republicans favor defending our allies' security as much as we do now, um, and also a plurality, say, signing free trade agreements with other countries. This also comes across in how Republicans and Democrats think about the effectiveness of various foreign policy approaches. Uh, and you'll see the one item on here that majorities across party lines see as being very effective is maintaining existing US alliances. Uh, this was something that Brendan referenced early on in the views that US alliances across Europe, East Asia, and the Middle East were generally good for both the United States and our allies, or at least good for the United States. And you see it come up time and again throughout the data. Uh, Americans quite like our allies. They see them as being beneficial for our security. They think it's a very effective approach uh, to achieving our foreign policy goals. Beyond that, you start to see some of the same divisions between Republicans and Democrats that you saw earlier. The Republicans are much more likely to say that maintaining US military superiority is a very effective approach for US foreign policy. And they say the same about drone strikes against suspected terrorists in other countries. In contrast, Democrats are more likely to favor and say that it's very effective signing international agreements. That general embrace of US allies uh, also translates more specifically into an embrace of NATO. Uh, though I will note that since the 1990s, there's been a bit of a partisan gap on this item, um, particularly notable in the last few years. Uh, majorities of Americans, since we started asking this question in 1974, have consistently said that the U.S. should either maintain or increase the U.S. commitment to NATO. Uh, as you'll see in our 2020 data, though, Republicans and Democrats are a bit divided. They're on the same side, but 85% of Democrats compared to 60% of Republicans favor maintaining or increasing the U.S. commitment to NATO. It'll be interesting to see how this evolves in the next few years. Uh, as you'll see during the Cold War times, Republicans were the group that were more likely to embrace NATO as a military alliance. Um, we're not sure how this is going to evolve in the future. Matching Democrats' general inclination toward internationalism and international organizations, they're also much more likely to say that organizations like the United Nations or the World Health Organization or the World Trade Organization should be more involved than they are now in addressing global problems. Democrats are also more likely to say that the United States itself should be more involved in addressing world problems compared to 42% of Republicans. Beyond those organizations, Americans aren't necessarily you know, raring for any other particular country to get more involved. Uh, and they're not particularly keen to see China get more involved in solving world problems. Now on the trade front briefly, uh, Brendan mentioned earlier that uh, trade had been a bipartisan item. We'd seen these bipartisan increases in trade being good for the U.S. economy and for creating jobs. For globalization, the story is a little bit different, which I think gets somewhat at the differences how, in how Americans think about trade and how they think about globalization, even though, even though those are often sort of conflated topics in the, our discourse. Democrats are much more likely to see the globalization being mostly good for the United States, whereas Republicans are and have been somewhat divided on this. So 55% of Republicans today, compared to 75% of Democrats, think it's mostly good for the United States. And another question that we asked this year sort of gets at this split, uh, where Democrats say 
that it would be better if countries coordinated the production of critical goods globally, which would keep prices low, even if it means relying on other countries' production if shortages arise. So Democrats, in keeping with their internationalism, are more likely to say that we should work with other countries on this, even if it means being dependent on them. For Republicans, that's less the case. 60% of Republicans say that the US should produce its critical goods here and not buy or sell them overseas, even if that comes at a higher cost in terms of the cost of goods. Republicans being more inclined to self-sufficiency, um, a little bit less convinced about the benefits of globalization, less convinced about the benefits of international organizations more broadly. And that again is one of these recurring themes that crops up across questions and across years. Now we promised you some China data. Uh, we have a lot, so we're only gonna show you a little bit of this. Uh, if you'd like more, there's a lot more available on our website. So as I'm sure you've noticed, uh, relations between the US and China uh, have taken a pretty sharp downward turn. Um, and it took a little bit for public attitudes to catch up, but they now have. Um, views of China as measured on this zero to 100 scale are now lower than at any point ever. They are lower than they were during the Cold War. They are lower than in our 1990 survey, which came about a year after Tiananmen. Uh, this is about where Americans put the Soviet Union in our Cold War polls in 1978 through 1986. Americans also now clearly see the US and China as being rivals rather than partners, uh, though they were split on this question from 2006 up through March 2018. And if you'll recall, March 2018 was already a period where the US and China uh, were starting to escalate uh, a trade and tariff war. At the time, the bottom hadn't really fallen out of the relationship. And a lot of the questions that I got from policy audiences were, when is the public going to, to catch on? When are they going to wake up? Well, now they have. In fact, a majority of Americans now describe China as both an economic and security threat. Uh, about two thirds of Americans overall, including 83% of Republicans and a majority of Democrats at 53. Uh, there are some Americans who see China as a partner in both fronts, including a quarter of Democrats. Uh, and then there's another 20% or so of Democrats who see China as an economic partner, but also a security threat. This sharp shift in views of China also shows up in this long running question we ask about the development of China as a world power. Uh, as you saw earlier, two thirds of Republicans see this as a critical threat to the United States. That is the highest level we've recorded for Republicans in our polls dating back to 1990. Uh, and the 55% of Americans overall who see China's rise as a critical threat puts it back to where it was in the 1990s, uh, where China looked like it was going to be the next competitor to the United States after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So these general shifts in how Americans think about China and the threat they see from China's rise has also led to shifts in how the US should respond. From more than a decade of council polling from 2006 up through 2019, two thirds of Americans consistently said that the US should undertake friendly cooperation and engagement with China. And that is no longer the case. Americans are now split on this question. Uh, you'll see here data both from the 2020 Chicago Council Survey and from the March 2021 Trilateral Survey. And uh, now 51% of Americans say that we should actively work to limit the growth of China's power compared to 47% who prefer cooperation and engagement. The rising threat of China has also reinforced for Americans the value of US alliances in Asia. Uh, Americans have consistently favored a uh, policy that promotes a closer relationship with allies like Japan and South Korea, rather than seeking a new partnership with China uh, that has grown over the years and remains at a very high point, about three in four Americans. That said, there are some partisan differences here. And while on the right, you'll see that all Americans across party lines favor building up those strong relationships with our allies, uh, Democrats are divided on how to deal with the rise of China's power. 49% uh, say that we should actively limit the growth of China. 51% say we should undertake friendly cooperation and engagement. Uh, and this is sort of the pattern that you're starting to see in a lot of different questions on China. Republicans are very concerned about China's rise. They see it as an economic threat. They see it as a military threat. They see it as the greatest threat facing the country. 
In response, they want to actively limit China's growth. They are willing to support a range of policies aimed to do that, and they're willing to work with U.S. allies to accomplish it. Democrats are split. Uh, some Democrats still want to try to cooperate with China, particularly when it comes to things like climate change, uh, as you'll see in this next slide. Uh, Democrats are more likely than Republicans to favor working with China to limit climate change, to prevent future pandemics. Uh, but at the same time, you get bipartisan support for a number of policies aimed at containing China's growth in certain areas. Uh, bipartisan growth, bipartisan support for prohibiting U.S. companies from selling sensitive high-tech products to China. Um, Two-thirds of Americans support banning Chinese telecom companies uh, from doing business in the United States. Uh, their support for naval exercises in the South China Sea, and Americans are split right now on boycotting the 2022 Beijing Olympics in response to China's human rights abuses. Uh, that would be a huge slap in the face to China. It would also be very controversial at home. Um, as I wrote about recently, the 1980 Olympic boycott was popular at the time, but it did come with a bit of a backlash and a lot of regret later on. So this is an area we're clearly going to be watching. I suspect everyone will be watching it very closely. Um, we'll have more data in a few months that'll tell us how American views on China are evolving. Uh, but China's not the only major country the U.S. is dealing with these days. Uh, Brendan, Russia to you. Yeah, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent polling on Russia, um, just to kind of give a brief overview of kind of what's been going on in the last several years. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, there was a lot of I think hope that Russia was going to become a democracy, um, but although relations stayed relatively um, warm, um, things took a sharp turn after 2014 uh, when Russia annexed Crimea um, and its um, perhaps fledgling relationship with the West really fell apart and it kind of became more oriented towards China. And um, I'll get a little bit more into that later, but more recently, um, I think there has become there's some division has grown among the U.S. population as um, at the end of the tail end of the Obama administration after the Crimea annexation, there was a lot of you know harsh rhetoric towards Russia, and then there was a lot of talk about interference in the 2016 elections. Um, but then during um, during the Trump administration, there was a bit of a softer tone, I'll say, towards uh, Russia and Putin. There was a Helsinki summit, um, as well as some other kind of high profile uh, taking Putin's word. And I think that caused a bit of a divide um, among the American population, which I will also get to. But um, now as the Biden administration has taken power, um, we see another shift. Um, Biden has been putting sanctions on Russia for a couple of high profile events, the Solar Winds hack, as well as the events relating to Alexei Navalny, which I will also get to a little later. Um, but it's a little unclear um, where things are going to go. Um, but to start, I will talk a little bit about Russian uh, attitudes toward the United States. And you'll see here that this has fluctuated a lot over time. Um, and one other thing I'll add, um, as I think Craig mentioned earlier, uh, this data comes from our partner in Russia, the Levada Analytical Center, one of the uh, last or only independent research organizations in Russia. They're labeled a foreign agent, um, which you know, gives them some credibility in an odd way. Um, but so uh, we see there's a lot of fluctuation. Um, in the early 2010s, Russian views toward the United States were fairly positive. You know, 45 to 50% were saying that they have a positive view, um, but that took a sharp turn after the annexation of Crimea and all the sanctions and international condemnation that followed. And in early 2014, 71% of Russians said they had a negative view of the United States. This is the beginning of the so-called Crimea consensus. Um, it was a moment of relative cohesion among the Russian public and the Russian government because a lot of Russians were very proud that Crimea had been annexed. It was formerly a part of Russia um, until I think the middle of the 20th century and um, the return to Russia was I think a bit of a triumphant and defiant moment. So this consensus lasted for a few years and you can see right around 2018, it started to fall off. Um, I think more protests popped up and um, people became more critical of Putin, I think especially some pension reforms. So, uh, that has 
kind of that negative sentiment has sort of dwindled. And now in 2021, we're looking at 43% of Russians say they have a negative view, whereas 39% of Russians say they have a positive view. So despite the recent overwhelmingly negative feelings, things are a lot more split nowadays. Um, with the Biden administration taking a bit of a harsher stance towards Russia, I'll be curious to see how these attitudes develop. Um, but um, I think interestingly, feelings toward Russia among Americans uh, have taken a bit of a different turn. Um, so similarly, you can see that this has changed a lot over the years. Um, but up until uh, about 2016, things were, um, Americans were pretty much in agreement on how they felt about Russia. In the early, uh, in the late 70s, 80s, um, end of the Cold War, feelings were very, very low. This is the, um, the same thermometer question that Craig was referencing earlier. Um, it's a zero to 100 scale, zero being very cold, unfavorable feelings, 100 being very warm and favorable feelings. So you see these Cold War uh, era sentiments were very low, around 30, 20. Um, but the, uh, after the fall of the USSR, they shot up to around 60, uh, 59 in 1990. And that persisted with a slight decline until 2014 when things dropped uh, almost back to cold, uh, cold War levels following the annexation of Crimea again. Since then, uh, feelings have remained uh, very negative. Um, and in 2020, among Democrats, you see they registered the same sentiment that they had in 1982. So um, things are certainly among Americans not taking a very good term in terms of their uh, views of Russia. I think the other interesting thing about this graph, as I kind of alluded to, is that you can start to see that these lines are diverging after 2016. Republicans are a little higher in their mean sentiment, whereas uh, Democrats are a little bit lower. I think, as I said, this might be um, a product of some of the rhetoric during the Trump administration, but it will be interesting to see what happens during the Biden administration as he takes a bit of a different stance. Um, however, despite these negative views, that does not mean that Americans don't want to work with Russia. Um, we asked this question, uh, how great a priority is it for the United States and Russia to work together on the following uh, issues? Um, and this is the percentage of people who say that it is essential for the countries to work together. Um, so we see that in general, uh, Americans are pretty, they think it's essential to work with Russia on a lot of these issues. In particular, the most, the ones that pop out are the nuclear issues, limiting the buildup of nuclear weapons in both countries and preventing Iran and North Korea from developing nuclear weapons capability. Um, around 70% of Americans think those are essential to work together on. And those are bipartisan majorities who think so. Um, and for a lot of these, you see uh, bipartisan majorities, uh, with a couple of notable exceptions. Um, first, limiting the effects of climate change. Um, this is, climate change is something that we have for a while seen a, one of the largest partisan divides on in our data, and this is no exception. Um, Democrats are extremely likely, likely to view climate change as a critical threat to the United States, whereas uh, Republicans are very uh, unlikely to view that as a critical threat. So in that regard, um, this follows um, that result. The other one um, where we see a bit of a divide is on negotiating conventional arms control agreements. 65% um, of Democrats say that that's essential, just 41 of Republicans say the same. Um, this goes back a little bit to the foreign policy approaches that Craig was talking about earlier, um, as well as uh, we have a question regarding federal spending on uh, you know, the US budget and um, Republicans are always um, much more likely to want to expand uh, spending on defense. So um, I think another point where we have other data that kind of leads us to not be too surprised by these results. Um, and you don't see the Russian data here, but they were also saying that it's essential to work together on all of these um, issues with one notable exception, which is managing China's influence in the world. Um, very few Russians said that that is an essential thing to work together on. And that is a result of the um, very quickly growing Russia-China relationship. Um, so 
here is some more data from the Levada Analytical Center. Um, now this question, uh, first one, name five countries which you consider to be Russia's closest friends and allies. Now this is a multiple choice question. Um, so they were also choosing four other nations, but you can see that um, similarly to how after Crimea, views of America uh, became significantly more negative, uh, views of China in the same period became significantly more positive. Um, was around, you know, hovering around 20% uh, in the 2000s, early 2010s, shot up to 40% in 2014, and it's stayed that way since. Um, this is the highest, uh, in this question, this is the highest percentage of any country. So Russians view China as Russia's closest friend. Um, in 2014, um, the two countries also signed a 30-year, $400 billion gas deal. So I think that kind of marked the shifting relationship with closer cooperation um, economic, economically and I'm sure to a degree militarily as well. Um, and then this other question that we have here, does Russia's relationship with China strengthen, weaken, or have no change on Russia's ability to improve relations with the United States and Russia's position in the world? Now we see that uh, plurality, 34% of Russians say that uh, their relationship weakens Russia's ability to improve relations with the United States. But a majority say that it strengthens Russia's position in the world. So I think from this, you can determine that um, Russians are more interested in bolstering their own um, international power and influence rather than improving things with the United States. Um, and so I think this is going to be a growing alliance in the coming years and one that we will certainly be keeping a close eye on. So um, it will be interesting to see how this alliance transforms. I think currently people are viewing it maybe as a marriage of convenience, a sort of block countering the Western block, but um, should relations with the United States improve between either of those countries, there may be a shift in their own bilateral relationship. So um, it will be curious to see what happens. Um, Moving on to a more um, US-Russia related issue, um, we asked about kind of how Americans think the US should respond to the SolarWinds hack, which um, to refresh people, it's been kind of out of the news, I would say for a few months, but um, this company SolarWinds, which provides software to a lot of US public agencies, as well as private companies discovered that there had been a breach of their, uh, an update that they sent out to a lot of companies that um, I think allowed foreign actors, Russians to um, kind of infiltrate and collect a lot of information. So um, asking about how Americans think that the US should respond to that, majority said that we should impose additional sanctions against Russia. And this was a bipartisan uh, consensus. One thing I'll point out about this is that all of these questions have a pretty much equal bipartisan response, um, which I find pretty interesting given um, the kind of perhaps burgeoning uh, divide that I mentioned earlier. Um, but fewer than half want to conduct cyber attacks against Russia's government computer systems, conduct cyber attacks against Russian civilian infrastructure, and just one in 10 want to conduct airstrikes against Russian military targets. So um, Americans are not interested in uh, escalating the tension between the two countries in any major way. Sanctions have been a pretty much the go-to response for the last several years. And um, it looks like that's going to continue into the Biden administration. So, um, and this was fielded before the response was actually um, announced, which was additional sanctions. So um, uh, a nice moment of public opinion and policy kind of meeting together. Um, and then the next slide talks about um, Russian views of Alexei Navalny. Now, um, just to if you're unfamiliar, Alexei Navalny is the chief Russian opposition politician. Um, he's been kind of a vocal opponent of Putin's regime for several years. Um, and what kind of led to what's currently going on is um, in August of 2020, he was traveling, um, I think, uh, within Russia, I, I want to say. And um, he came very, he became very, very ill. Um, and ultimately was um, flown to Germany for medical treatment where he got better. It came out that it was a Russian intelligence officer that had poisoned him. Um, he ended up going back to Russia um, 
in what I think was viewed internationally as a pretty brave and martyring sort of move. He was in a, you know, immediately arrested and sentenced to three years in prison, and he's currently serving that sentence. And uh, a lot of the news recently has been him, you know, he's being treated horribly, his health is really deteriorating. And um, there has also been a lot of pressure on his kind of opposition movement from the Russian government. So um, amid all of this, um, we were kind of wondering, what do Russians view of Alexei Navalny and um, what do they think of this poisoning incident? And the results are pretty, um, pretty interesting, pretty uh, surprising, honestly. Uh, so this first one specifically references the poisoning incident. There are multiple versions of what happened to Alexei Navalny. Which of them seems the most plausible to you? Um, this was asked in December 2021 20, to 23. So um, before he came back to Russia, but um, after he was getting better from the initial uh, the, that poisoning attempt. So 30% of Russians say that there was no poisoning, all of it was staged. Another 19% say it is a provocation of the Western intelligence services. And just 15% say it's the government's attempt to eliminate a political opponent. So you can see very clearly that um, the propaganda um, around this incident has really affected public opinion in a major way. Um, for almost half of people to think that it's not the government's attempt to eliminate a political opponent. Um, it's, yeah, uh, a sh staggering statistic, I'll say. But um, moreover, this next question, how do you feel about Navalny's return to Russia, which, as I mentioned, was viewed pretty widely as a uh, sort of martyrdom uh, move. Um, but 51% of Russians say that they are neutral in, or indifferent to his return. and. 25% disprove, just 22% approve of this. So the main finding that we saw is that Russians are much less taken by Navalny's message than um, the international community is. Um, there are pockets of support among younger people and um, people who use the app Telegram, uh, I think probably um, a, a forum for kind of opposition minded people to connect, but the larger Russian population is not too interested in his activities or his um, the recent events. So an interesting, an interesting look into Russian politics. We'll certainly be doing more research on Russia in the not too distant future. So definitely stay tuned for this. Um, next, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent US-Iran research. Um, now, I think Craig mentioned earlier, we were working with a uh, Toronto-based organization that does polling in Iran. Um, it's, it's been really interesting to get this inside view of how Iranians view um, international events, um, even domestic, some domestic issues as well. Um, in terms of the US-Iran relationship, it's certainly been a very rocky several years. Um, it was looking pretty promising in 2015 when the joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, was uh, signed and came into effect. But, and um, that was also a big win for the moderate Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, who uh, actually won re election in 2017 based on the success, I think, of the JCPOA and his ability to get the US to remove some of its sanctions pressure from uh, Iran. But with the Trump administration's um, unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA and um, the ensuing slapback sanctions that were uh, imposed upon Iran. All of those gains that Hassan Rouhani had made were kind of erased and um, the Iranian public really, um, you, we see a big shift after that. And since then, um, I think Iranians belief in US credibility to return to this agreement and to honor it has really been impacted, which could have some really real implications right now as the Biden administration is trying to restart um, talks in the JCPOA. So um, it's a, an, inter an interesting moment in uh, US-Iran relations, not to mention the um, assassination in January 2020 of Qasem Soleimani, the um, Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps general. So. Um, a lot, a lot of moving parts here. So um, this first slide, I'll talk about kind of 
what Americans think of the Iran agreement. Now, um, we see that there's a bit of a divide here, and there has been since, um, since the beginning, uh, since we started asking this question, that is. So this question asks about whether you, or not the US should participate in the following international agreements. This one, the agreement that lifts some international economic sanctions against Iran in exchange for strict limits on its nuclear weapons. Now, from the get-go, uh, Democrats were very in support of this. Um, I think, you know, on the thinking about the question on cooperation and collaboration, this really, I think, gets at that. This was an opportunity to extend an olive branch and kind of improve our relationship with this longtime uh, foe since 1979. Um, whereas Republicans from the start were pretty um, not not too enthusiastic about it. I think the, the discussion among the opponents of the deal was that it didn't go far enough. It was a temporary Band-Aid to uh, solve the deal. But um, at any rate, um, it's shifted a little bit over time. I think interestingly, in 2018, Republicans, more than half, uh, said that the US should participate. And it's kind of gone down since then. Um, but today, more than half of Americans overall um, say that the US should participate. Um, so I think for the Biden administration, that's kind of a nod from the public to go ahead with these talks, even though there is some internal division on uh, among the different political groups. As far as Iranians view on the um, JCPOA, it has also shifted a lot over the years. Um, they were initially very enthusiastic about it, 76% approved in that uh, kind of remained until 2017. Um, we saw this strong majority and that started to dip around 2018. Um, that was when the US was um, leaving the agreement. Um, and in the, come, or in the following years, it dipped even below with a majority saying they disapprove of the agreement. But now um, it's flipped again. Uh, a majority say they do support the agreement. 41% uh, say they disapprove. So um, it's kind of split. I think from the other data that um, we don't have slides for, um, Iranians do support the JCPOA, but they're very wary of the US commitment to honor its obligations. And um, they're additionally very wary of additional uh, negotiations on its nuclear, or its missile program um, or other kind of security related things. So um, while it looks like there is an opportunity to revive the agreement, um, it's, mm, there's some conflicting beliefs, I think. But um, I think one larger implication for Iranian domestic politics is that views of Hassan Rouhani, the moderate president really fell after the withdrawal um, the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA. Um, his favorability rating was extremely high, um, even before the JCPOA was signed, and it remained that way um, until 2018. Um, but after that, it took a pretty sharp turn, and it's been pretty negative since then. I think this correlates pretty strongly to when the U.S. pulled out of the JCPOA. Um, another kind of interesting Bit about this is the Iranian presidential elections are coming up in June um, next month. And some of the data that we have seen shows that a lot, a majority, two thirds of Iranians say that they would like the next president to be um, a critic of Hassan Rouhani. And as one of the more moderate politicians uh, in Iranian politics right now, um, in terms of the prominent people, this signals a potential shift towards a more conservative um, or principalist leader, um, that's how they're called in Iran. So um, if the US and Iran are able to strike an agreement on the JCPOA in the next um, month or two, that could be a positive sign for uh, moderate candidates, but it's looking like, um, we'll see what happens in this election, but um, Iran may be taking a more kind of hardline conservative turn um, but again, we will see what happens in the next month and a half. Um, and then finally, uh, this is just a question about um, which countries Iran, Iranians view as the most important to their own country. Um, and this is really interesting because even more so than its regional allies, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, Iranians view China as the most important country. Um, they recently signed a really large deal to improve economic and uh, military cooperation over um, 
a decently long period of time, I think 20 to 30 years. Um, and the fact that this relationship is one that Iranian view is so important relative, again, to these regional allies, which serve as a buffer um, between itself and Israel um, is, I think, a pretty telling sign that China's influence is expanding um, in many parts of the world, including the Middle East. Um, certainly, we read a lot about Russia's involvement in, uh, or actually, never mind. Um, but I think another interesting point beyond um, the importance of its regional allies in China is that um, a lot of Iranians said that the United States is very important to uh, their country. Um, now, obviously, the United States isn't an ally. So I think this reveals that Iranians have a pretty pragmatic view of Iran's international and bilateral relationships. So, um, which I think I found that to be a very interesting kind of uh, insight into how Iranians view international politics. Um, they do have a realistic view of how things are, uh, of how things go on. So, um, Anyways, this has just been a snippet of the data that we have just collected and released, but um, a lot more um, to come. So stay tuned on this as well. Um, yes, if you can believe it, this is only uh, a fraction of the data that we have uh, at the council and in our survey reports. Uh, if you want more data, uh, check out our website at the chicagocouncil.org. Uh, you can also sign up for email updates. You can follow us on Twitter um, and Hopefully in the future, we'll be back to talk with you again. Great. Thank you very much, Craig and Brendan. Uh, we now move on to the Q&A portion of the program. Audience members, please submit your questions via the chat function. You can access the chat function by clicking on the chat box icon, which should be located near your audio and video buttons. Uh, while we wait for more questions to come in, I would like to mention that we're grateful to be able to make our online programs available free and to the public, but we rely on the support of our members and attendees in order to operate. We would deeply appreciate a free will offering uh, donation to help us cover our operating expenses, particularly during this period of online only programming. You can find the link to donate in the chat section. All right, and now let's begin our Q&A session. Uh, feel free to turn on your video at this time if you would like, but please remain muted. Uh, I, I want to begin uh, with uh, sort of related questions about methodology. So, so one person asked about sampling in the United States, and you could maybe say a little more about that. I'm curious about how many, uh, what proportion of the respondents, let's say in the 2020 council survey, uh, identified as Democrats, Republicans, and independents, because I suspect those were not uh, the same size groupings within your sample. Uh, sure, so I can talk a little bit about the sampling and then I can uh, track down the exact number for the partisan affiliations. Uh, this is something that we've actually been looking at quite a bit in the last few years. Um, so the council surveys are conducted in the United States uh, by Ipsos using their knowledge panel. Uh, the knowledge panel was first developed in the early 2000s uh, by a firm called Knowledge Networks of Palo Alto. Uh, it is an online survey panel that is recruited using traditional survey methods. Uh, so through address-based sampling and through random digit dialing. I think these days it's primarily address-based sampling. Uh, that allows Ipsos to create a panel that is broadly representative of the United States population. Uh, so to avoid some of the problems that opt-in uh, survey panels have with unrepresentativeness, um, but while still being able to use an online survey platform. Uh, for us, that's particularly useful. Our questionnaire, as you can probably gather from the kind of the amount of data that we presented, uh, is on the longer side. It, it is difficult to do by telephone. Um, we also sometimes have graphics, uh, for example, for that feeling thermometer question. Uh, there is actually a thermometer graphic to, to indicate to the respondent what the different levels mean. Uh, and that itself is a holdover from the 1974 through 1998 council surveys, which were conducted in person uh, back in the day when in-person polling was uh, the preferred and really only way to go. Uh, in terms of the, the sample composition, um, my recollection is that we had more Democrats than Republicans and a large proportion of independents. Uh, this is more or less what most uh, polls look like. If you include independents who say they lean toward one party or another, you get a much more even split between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, this is one of the uh, kind of secrets of independents uh, in the United States. Most of them are not actually independent. They simply don't want to say that they're Republicans or Democrats. Uh, 
but in fact, those independents who say they lean toward Republican or Democratic parties look very much like strong partisans. Uh, they hold most of the same views, um, and they're more aligned with strong partisans than they are with people who say they're just you know, slightly Republican or slightly Democratic. Great, thanks. Um, the, the first couple of um, uh, questions that came in um, go to the issue of what is driving Americans' opinion of foreign policy issues, and, and uh, both are kind of phrased to suggest that uh, US public opinion is being driven by powerful people, either in politics or business or, or other uh, sectors. Can, can you address to what extent your uh, research gives you any insights into the drivers of Americans' views of the world? It's a good question. Um, and it's a topic of you know, certainly plenty of academic debate about uh, how, to what extent are policymakers responding to public opinion versus creating public opinion. Um, and there's definitely a feedback loop going on. Um, I think I would say that the American public generally demonstrates that it has an underlying um, ideology is too strong a word, uh, but an underlying way of thinking about foreign policy um, and that it does split out in some ways by partisanship. And you see that uh, those sort of underlying currents that Brendan and I both talked about in different parts of our presentation um, with Republicans being more likely to favor self-sufficiency and military strength, while Democrats are more interested in international cooperation. Um, those show up repeatedly across years and across questions and across different types of questions. Um, and those, uh, how much of that is you know, gained from their particular media preferences versus an inherent political attribute that has drawn them to the party is really hard to say uh, from our data. Um, I will say policymakers often, when we, we brief congressional staffers uh, every year, uh, they're often surprised by some of the data that comes out um, because they don't necessarily agree with the positions that the public takes. Um, even within you know, re Republicans disagreeing with what Republicans say, Democrats dealing with, disagreeing with what Democrats say, um, there's a limited ability for policymakers to meet the public. Um, they can present new information, they can bring new issues to the attention of the public, um, but uh, as anyone who's ever you know, talked to sort of everyday Americans knows, Americans can be fairly stubborn in their views. <laughs> Great. Uh, one question came in about um, whether Americans uh, worry about China and Russia teaming up together. And I, I'm curious if you have any questions that might um, uh, address that uh, potential issue. I don't know that, okay, wait, I'm just pulling up some data. Um, so it looks like that's not something that Americans are too aware of. Um, one question that we asked in 2020 was, do you think that Russia and China are mostly rivals or mostly partners? And 50% uh, said mostly rivals and 45% said mostly partners. Um, so I think there isn't a clear sense of the growing relationship between the two countries. Um, though I do also think that that will probably become more clear um, in the coming years. Yeah. And almost certainly American policymakers worry about that, right? Uh, so yeah, so it's one of those things where the, the public is lagging behind a little bit. Um, do you have uh, any explanation for the fact that Iranians uh, give Saudi Arabia a relatively low importance rating for, for their country? I would say, I mean, there's a lot of friction between the two countries. There are these, besides Israel, they're the two kind of poles of the region. And um, I think I, in one regard, I'm a little surprised in the sense that they said that the United States is very important. They're obviously a rival um, internationally, um, but Iranians do see the relative importance of Iran to their own economy and security situation um, that they don't see that for Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm not sure how to interpret that. I think in the one regard, it could be um, a sort of, you know, defiance of the uh, kind of rivalry between them, but um, given how they're so close together and um, have present such a security 
uh, threat to one another, I would think that they would see, given given how they have a bit of a pragmatic view, in my view, I, I do think it's a little surprising that they wouldn't have said it's more important. Well, I think at uh, this point, we uh, unfortunately are out of time and have to bring this to a close. Uh, thank you very much again to Craig Gaffura and Brendan Helm. And uh, this was a very informative presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us today. Um, it's my pleasure, uh, Brendan and Craig, uh, to virtually present each of you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. And uh, we will uh, make arrangements to get these delivered to you uh, very soon. Uh, so again, thank you uh, to our presenters. Thanks to everyone in the viewing audience. Um, thanks again to our sponsors for their generous support. We are adjourned. <laughs>